Welcome to episode 7 of Nihon no Kon Yohen Shokai. Uh, in this episode, we're going to uh, return to the Famicom. Uh, we talked about the Famicom in the very first episode of this series. Famicom is Nintendo's first real foray into the home console market, the first really successful home console uh, attempt uh, by Nintendo, and it would eventually become the NES in 1995. So uh, even if the Famicom wasn't quite the biggest thing in Japan, uh, it most definitely was one of the biggest things in North America uh, in, in beginning in 1985. Uh, so we talked a little bit about region locking in uh, the first episode, but just to reiterate that games uh, in Japan uh, came out on Famicom-sized cartridges, and games on the NES came out a little bit bigger. Uh, there is a way to play Famicom games into an NES using an adapter, uh, but the other way around, not so much. Uh, so in, in some ways, uh, in a lot of ways, <laughs> uh, these games are region-locked. So uh, we're going to get started with a pair of games. Uh, the first game of which we're going to talk about is... One moment. <laughs> Tojin Makyo Den, uh, Heracles no Echo, or Glory of Heracles, Legend of the Fighting Demon Slayer. Uh, this is a 1987 JRPG developed and published by Data East that is very heavily rooted in Greek mythology. If you couldn't already tell by the name Heracles. <laughs> um, so it's essentially a Dragon Quest clone uh, where you play as Heracles and you're trying to save Aphrodite from, from Hades. Uh, and that's not a lot of information, but that's kind of the, the gist of the game. Uh, but this is the first game in the series, which series, which was then followed up by Heracles no Echo 2, Titan no Metsubo, or Glory of Heracles 2, Titan's Downfall. So this is a 1989 sequel, also developed and published by Data East, that is significantly different. Um, it's still very based in Greek mythology. However, you no longer play as Heracles, despite the game still being called Glory of Heracles. <laughs> you instead play as a party of characters, which include very generic names like Hero, Girl, and Grandma, among others. Uh, but you do get a chance to play as Heracles later in the game. Uh, it's an overall improvement as a game uh, in regards to features. Uh, for example, there's a day-night cycle uh, and, and overall new overhauled system. Uh, and the story is supposed to be a lot better. Uh, again, still Greek, but overall better. So it's an overall better game uh, on the whole from the, from the first game. Uh, so the series received three Jet, uh, Japan-only sequels, uh, some on the Super Famicom and some on the original Game Boy, uh, along with various virtual console releases in that time. Uh, but in 2003, Data East, the develop and, developer and publisher of Glory of Heracles, went bankrupt. So Payon and Nintendo bought the rights to the series, and the first spin-off game, which is also the last game using the Glory of Heracles moniker, was released in 2008 on the DS uh, as a first-party first party titled game, uh, despite the fact that original writers uh, from the original games uh, worked on that spinoff title. Uh, it's the first game, that one, the DS game, is the first game uh, to come to North America. And if I remember correctly hearing from Did You Know Gaming, it's very interesting, but because since the game is in a way owned by Nintendo, um, it is owned by Nintendo, period. Uh, there's a lot of uh, like mild Nintendo references, like a lot of really cool Easter eggs. So that's pretty cool. Uh, kind of weird uh, history uh, that, you know, never left Japan uh, for the first few titles. And then all of a sudden there's a spinoff title on the DS, you know, almost about 15 years ago. And that's the last we've ever heard of Glory of Heracles. Um, there is a very small reference to Heracles in Super Smash Ultimate. Um, but if I'm being honest with you, it's it's kind of hard to tell. You wouldn't even know unless you saw the name Glory of Heracles written on the character. So uh, just kind of a neat little piece of uh, gaming history that eventually became Nintendo history. <laughs> Next is Hector 87. Uh, this is a 1987 shoot 'em up developed and published by Hudson Soft. And it plays very similar to Xevious, uh, where you can attack both ground and air targets uh, while you're in the air. Uh, and this is a follow-up to Hudson's 1986 Star Soldier, which was another shoot 'em up uh, So you play through six histories uh, in both vertical and horizontal shooting sections, uh, each with a boss at the end of their level. 
uh, which is somewhat unique since most shoot 'em ups are just vertical or just horizontal, not both. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, not a whole lot I could say about this game, but it did come to North America in 1990 as Starship Hector on the NES. Uh, and honestly, I bought it because I thought the name Hector 87 was very interesting and uh, to, to go along with the fact that Famicom games are very cheap. So uh, pretty neat, weird, little, not much of a history, but it's still pretty cool nonetheless. Next is Hokuto no Ken, uh, which is better known as Fist of the North Star. So Fist of the North Star, or Hokuto no Ken, uh, is a manga that began in 1983 and very quickly exploded into a huge media franchise. Uh, there's an anime, there are several movies, uh, there's novels, there's pachinko machines, and of course, video games. Uh, and it's also one of the best-selling mangas of all time, uh, concerning the fact that it was very well received. Uh, so it revolves around a hero named Kenshiro, who has mastered Hokuto Shinken, uh, which is a fighting style that revolves around deadly moves based on knowing your enemy's vital points. Uh, and despite how morbid that sounds, uh, Kenshiro does fight for the good and against the bad, just in a very deadly and gruesome way. <laughs> so there's something like 25 games released for various platforms since the 80s uh, based on Hokuto no Ken. Uh, and the games are seemingly released by Toei and Sega in the beginning and were released by other publishers for other systems over time. So kind of this weird, very shared history about the game. Uh, this one specifically is a 1986 side-scrolling platformer developed by Shoei and published by Toei, where you fight through five very, very, very long stages with different bosses at the end of each. Um, it's the third game in the franchise, but it's the first one published by Toei. So it uh, kind of goes along with that very weird uh, release history of having uh, a lot of different people working on, a, on, on the franchise. So only a very few a number of games uh, came to North America. Uh, this game's sequel came out on the NES. There's also a Game Boy game, a PS3 game, a 360 game. But most recently, we did get kind of Fist of the North Star on Switch. It's actually a fitness boxing crossover. So it's more just boxing than it is Fist of the North Star, but still uses the IP nonetheless. Uh, the most recent game that is of the nature of Fist of the North Star came out on PS4 in 2018. Um, I had heard of Fist of the North Star specifically because of the bo fitness boxing game. Uh, so when I saw Fist of the North Star, I was like, I want to know the connection between these. And so I did. I figured it out. Very cool. <laughs> Next is a game I am very fond of that I teased a little bit holding them like this, but that is Ice Climber. So Ice Climber is an adorable uh, vertical platformer from 1984, developed and published by Nintendo. Uh, it was initially uh, developed for arcades, and you play as Popo and Nana, scaling icy mountains to retrieve vegetables from a condor. Uh, it sounds very silly, but the gameplay is so adorable. Uh, it looks very addicting. Uh, every time I pick it up, I have a hard time putting it down. Uh, not that I'm good at it, but it's still very cool nonetheless. So uh, the game was brought to Famicom in 1985 and later brought to NES, also in 1985, as a black box release. So uh, we talked a little bit about black box games in the first episode. Uh, this, you know, black artwork uh, in this style, uh, very popular and denotes a lot of the very classic NES games that released. So that's not the only place Ice Climber was brought, though, because it was also released in... 2004 on the Game Boy Advance on the Famicom Mini and Classic NES series uh, line of games. It was brought to virtual consoles worldwide, uh, 2007 on the Wii, 2012 on 3DS, 2013 on Wii U, and also 2018 on Switch Online, uh, but it was also released on the uh, 2016 NES Classic Edition or the Famicom Classic Edition, more commonly known as like the NES Mini, uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and the arcade version was also brought to the Famicom Disk System in 1988. So, uh, brought everywhere. <laughs> uh, there were no other Ice Climber games, like no sequels, but the characters have appeared in Smash games, uh, the first time being in uh, Melee in 2001, uh, and has made uh, appearances since then. Uh, but Ice Climber has also made appearances on WarioWare games, some Kirby games. So it is a piece of Nintendo history that has uh, shown itself more than once. Uh, which is pretty cool, but uh, for as adorable as it is, it's it's cool to now have both 
original releases. Next is Jesus Kyofu no Bio Monster. Uh, this is a 1987 visual novel initially developed and published by Enix for home computers and was ported to the Famicom two years later in 1989. Uh, this release was developed by Chunsoft and published by King Records Music Company. Pretty interesting. Uh, so Jesus is the acronym for the spaceship you play on in the year 2061 as you investigate Halley's Comet as it approaches Mars in a horrorish type of adventure. Um, it's a visual novel, so you know it can only be scary to such an extent. Uh, but your goal is to solve puzzles and different actions. Uh, correspond to different outcomes, different endings. So that is pretty cool. Um, but it had a sequel only for home computers in the late 80s. Uh, but that's the last of the series. So this series is wildly dormant. Uh, don't know if we'll ever see it again, but it is cool to get the original game uh, for, for home consoles nonetheless. Next is Karateka, or <laughs> this 1984 martial arts game developed and published by Jordan Mechner a single guy uh, while he was at Yale University <laughs> initially for the home computer, the Apple II here in North America. So it's, 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 it is a game, it's a fighting game, uh, but it's also kind of cinematic, if that makes sense. Um, it's one of the earliest fighting games ever, uh, and it looks like it could have been on the Atari 2600 just based on gameplay. Like if you looked at it, you definitely could have thought it would have been on an earlier system. Uh, you know, most because of the fact that it was released for the home computer first, uh, not on Famicom. Uh, but you play as a martial artist who is trying to save a princess from a fortress. Pretty straightforward for a fighting game. Uh, it performed well and was ported everywhere. It was initially released in the U.S., uh, ported to North American, North American home computers and Atari systems, some European home computers, but then the Famicom in 1985, so just a year later. Uh, it did receive another Japanese home computer release in 1988, and there was also an Asia-only Game Boy port that I could find very little info about besides Wikipedia. <laughs> so, uh, this game received a remake in 2012 on PS3 and 360, and in 2013 on iOS, which is kind of a funny place to have it. Uh, but my interest with the game stems from hearing about the making of Karateka, which was released this just this past August as a way to sort of retrospect the game and its development. Um, the company doing it, it did it, the company that did it is Digital Eclipse, uh, which is the same company, which is the company that made Atari 50, which was a very beautiful uh, retrospective and collection of original Atari games. So uh, they did a fantastic job with that. And uh, I'm, I'm sure they did a fantastic job with this too. I haven't gone around to getting the making of Karateka, but uh, I know it's getting a limited run release, so I will be picking that up when it comes out. <laughs> so very cool to get the original game, even if it's not in its original form, but still cool nonetheless. Next is King's Knight on a very pretty green cartridge. Uh, this is a 1986 scrolling shooter developed by Cancel and published by Squaresoft, initially for the home computer, the MSX. Uh, but brought to the Famicom the same year, uh, then developed by Bits Laboratory. So you play as different characters with different abilities in this vertical, in vertical shooting levels. Uh, you have power-ups to level up your characters. It's almost RPG-like, uh, but your goal is to, believe it or not, rescue a princess. I never would have gathered that from a game called King's Knight. <laughs> uh, it was brought to NES, uh, the, brought to the NES in 1989, uh, there was a remake released for iOS in 2017, but it was shut down just a year later, which is kind of silly and kind of seems like a waste of time and development. Uh, but it was also adapted into a manga in 1999, which is a very rare case because so many games that we talk about, uh, including uh, Fist of the North Star that we just talked about in this episode, start as mangas and then become uh, video games. But in this case, it was a video game first and then became a manga 10 years, uh, 13 years later. So, kind of silly. Um, King's Knight's a cool name. I'm a big fan of color, color green, so cool to get a green cartridge, I guess. <laughs> Speaking of games that started as mangas, uh, we have Kinikuman Muscle Tag Match. Uh, so, Kinikuman, or better known as Muscle Man, uh, is a manga that began in 1979, so a long time ago. Uh, it began as a parody to Ultraman, which itself 
was a humongous media franchise that began in 1966 uh, in Japan. So, uh, you know, this, this little uh, manga from 1979 took on an absolute behemoth uh, media franchise in Japan. Uh, but Kanikuman is about a superhero who has to win a wrestling tournament uh, if he wants to remain prince of his home planet. Uh, the manga grew into an anime uh, with films, action figures. Uh, this this is a wrestling game. We'll talk about it in just a second. But the whole thing is about wrestling, so action figures made a lot of sense. Uh, and a small handful of video games, this one included. So this was released in 1985, believe it or not, as a wrestling game uh, developed by TOSE and published by Bandai. Uh, it's based on the manga, where you play through round-based matches. <laughs> uh, it came to North America in 1986, uh, but it removed a lot of the references to Kanikuman uh, since the U.S. did not know a lot about the series at all. Um, but this game also uh, it had another release, if you will, a special release, uh, where it came out as a gold cartridge, which is very hard to find. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're collecting Famicom games, that might be your holy grail. Uh, but it's just kind of funny nonetheless. Uh, Kanikuman did come to North America eventually as Ultimate Muscle, which is also the name of a spin-off fran spin part of the franchise uh, in Japan, but it came here as Ultimate Muscle, uh, and it had an anime here, manga, two games under the Ultimate Muscle uh, title. Uh, one is on the Game Boy Advance, I believe, and the other one's on GameCube, which I have come across before, but it was very expensive, and I had no reason to buy it. Uh, but my story with Ultimate Muscle goes back to the days of watching VHS tapes with my dad, so I was a huge Yu-Gi-Oh fan growing up. And, uh, you know, at the time you didn't have Netflix, so we had to watch uh, VHS tapes even before DVDs. So I very much remember having a VHS tape of like the first two or three Yu-Gi-Oh episodes. And because it was dubbed by four kids uh, and Ultimate Muscle was also dubbed by four kids, some of the commercials in the beginning of the VHS tape had ultimate muscle advertisements so i remember seeing it i remember the character and i remember the first time i saw the gamecube game i was like i know that character uh so that was really wild uh it, it gave me a reminder you know like 15 years later about what the series was not that i really remembered it from when i was you know uh in, in, in like kindergarten but nonetheless uh when i saw this i was like that's really cool i gotta get that uh so even if i don't own ultimate muscle on the gamecube i do own an ultimate muscle equivalent on the Famicom. Uh, this, this cartridge is also like very rounded compared to other ones, so I thought that was very interesting as well. Next, uh, two games that there's not a lot of information about, but still kind of interesting nonetheless. Uh, the first one is Lost Word of Jenny, Ushina Wareta Message. <laughs> so this is a 1987 platformer developed by TOSE and published by Takara, where you play as Jenny platforming levels to find missing letters to form the Lost Word. Uh, not a lot of information out there about this game, but I did find that Jenny, the character, is based on a doll in Japan. I don't know if that's 100% true, but that might be, like, the the impetus to, to getting a video game. Uh, it Looking at gameplay, it kind of looks like a very interesting Mario Metroidvania, which is a very specific type of explanation. So, uh, you know, as always, there's going to be sources and links in the description so if you want to check out the gameplay, uh, it's there. Maybe you can agree or disagree with me. But one of the interesting things I saw in the gameplay was that there's a lot of levels with a lot of different variety and types. For example, I saw a spaceship level. I saw a cake level. I saw a pirate ship level, just to name a few. Uh, so even though I don't know who Jenny is, uh, also now that I'm looking at the cartridge, she does look like a doll on the on the cartridge. And it also looks like there's a the count from Sesame Street on here. It's not, but it also kind of looks like that. <laughs> So just kind of a weird niche release, if you will. Next is a, a game that I'll just talk about it. So this is Lot Lot. Uh, it's a 1985 puzzle game developed and published by IRM initially for arcades, but it was brought to Famicom just within a few months, uh, developed by HAL Labs and published by Tokuma Shoten, uh, where you try to safely move pellets or pachinko balls to lower levels of the board you're playing on without a crab coming and cutting parts of the board. Yeah. 
that didn't make any sense to me either when I uh, was trying to watch what was happening. It even made less sense when it was uh, when I was reading it <laughs> to try and understand what was going on. So very confusing. Not gonna lie, the the game didn't look all that appealing. I got it because it was called Lot Lot, which is a funny name, and it's got crabs on it. Uh, but I didn't realize it was gonna be a puzzle game that isn't really all that appealing. The gameplay looked difficult. Uh, the guide I saw wasn't very helpful at all. Uh, didn't come to North America, but it was brought to Japanese home computers in 1986. So kind of weird release overall, but uh, still, you know, silly little things like that make uh, getting this into a collection all the more reason to, I guess. But uh, yeah, kind of funny nonetheless. The next is uh, Mario Open Golf. And I know what you're thinking if you saw uh, the Game Boy Color episode. <laughs> So, uh, this is a 1991 golf game developed and published by Nintendo, where you play as Mario and Luigi in a golfing tournament. Believe it or not. Uh, it's not gimmicky like future games that we may or may not have talked about in that Game Boy Color episode, which is why I said the Game Boy Color game is, like, the first game of its type. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, not, not gimmicky. It was more just a golf game using Nintendo characters. Uh, it featured those Mario characters, including the accountant Donkey Kong. <laughs> and some outfits uh, in the game were also brought to the Smash games, which is kind of a you know nice little Easter egg for the Smash games, nonetheless. It had a very weird release history in, involving the Famicom disc system that, when I tried reading about it, couldn't quite follow. Um, but I do know that it was brought to North America as NES Open Tournament Golf uh, just a week later. So uh, we, we did get this game. Uh, it still had Mario characters, but again, it wasn't gimmicky. It wasn't Mario Golf like we know it today. Um, but it's funny because this game is actually kind of difficult. Um, so when it was brought to North America, there were less holes and there was lower difficulty, despite the, the holes that are there are, are unchanged. So all they did was just remove the difficult ones uh, from the Japanese Mario Open Golf to NES Open Tournament Golf. So this went to Nintendo's Play Choice 10, which was an arcade machine by Nintendo. Uh, the same year, uh, it was also released on virtual consoles worldwide uh, on the Wii in 2007, 3DS in 2012, Wii U in 2014, and also brought to Switch Online in 2018. So that's pretty cool. But uh, Mario Golf game, uh, you know, early predecessor to what we would eventually get on the N64 Game Boy Color and, and the future past that. So uh, it's also just Mario. You gotta buy Mario, right? <laughs> Next is a is another weird one. So this is Marusa no Ona, uh, which is a 1989 visual novel developed and published by Capcom, of all big companies, uh, based on the 1987 movie, you know, so just two years later, called A Taxing Woman, about, get this, a tax invader, investigates, <laughs> a tax investigator, <laughs> Uh, who catches tax evaders. I conflated two words there. <laughs> so uh, seeing a game called A Taxing Woman without knowing that there was a movie called A Taxing Woman is, is kind of funny. Um, it's also very interesting that it's a visual novel about a you know Japan-only movie that was uh, released by Capcom. So kind of just weird little niche piece of history, I guess. So just pretty cool nonetheless. The next one is a weird one. Uh, very, very weird and almost frustrating to research. So uh, this is Mindseeker, which is a 1989 visual novel adventure something? Simulator, maybe? <laughs> Developed and published by Namco uh, that was made to train real-life people to have psychic powers. It's just as weird as it sounds. So you train under a famous Japanese psychic who is in real life, from the 1970s, but he would eventually confess to being a fraud before the game even released. So, from the get-go, this game was probably destined to fail, and so it did. So, there wasn't a lot of information about it, but Hardcore Gaming 101 uh, gave me a lot of detail, uh, but it did give it a scathing, scathingly bad review. <laughs> uh, but it at least acknowledges that the game is enthusiastic and true to the psychic hobby. Don't come after me, I'm just... That's just the best word I can come up with for, for explaining. Uh, what I gathered is that the illusion of control makes the game seem very lazy in design. 
Uh, and the game is mostly just based on luck anyway, so it's overall bad and frustrating to play. And again, it was frustrating to research because it was just a weird game to, to come across. So, uh, you know, psychic powers, am I right? <laughs> So last but not least, we got one more game, but there's a lot I got to say about this game. Uh, as always, we leave the best for last. So I briefly have talked about it in the past. I don't think I talked about it in, in the series, but I have talked about it in the past. Uh, Kunio Kun. So Kunio Kun is a video game series uh, that really deserves entirely its own video. I only have one game here, but I have a few more, but Again, you can make an entire retrospective just about Kunio Kun. So the series began in arcades in 1986 uh, about high school life, uh, almost autobiographical based on one of the, the writers of the game. Um, and it quickly gained in popularity from its releases on the Famicom slash NES as beat-em-ups. Uh, but the games spread into other genres, including sports. So pre-import collecting... I got Super Dodgeball, since you know from the Famicom, first Famicom episode and the first Game Boy episode that I love Dodgeball. Uh, and if you saw uh, September in review, you also know I like Handball, but one thing at a time. So this is Super Dodgeball. I bought it because it's a Dodgeball game. And I later found out that this was a localization of Neketsu Koko Dodgeball Boo, which this is not the new game for the episode. But it was very common for early Kunio Kun games to be localized to North America, but having its story and its franchising kind of ripped apart in North America so that they could be kind of uh, un... <laughs> what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, unassociated releases. Um, so that's kind of interesting alone. So when I learned that this was actually a Famicom game, it gave me some interest in the series, and I hoped... To collect more of the games, uh, especially that, you know, there's sports games. This is a dodgeball game. Uh, but for some reason, I find it very stressful to catalog all the games. So uh, it was even stressful to write some of this review, if you will, or, or information about the game. Uh, so if you happen to know a lot about Kunio Kun, uh, please let me know. <laughs> um, so, but the new game for this episode is uh, Ike Ike Neketsu Hokibu Subet Koronde Dairanto. Uh, which literally translates to Go Go Neketsu Hockey Club Skate Fall Great Free For All Brawl, uh, but more formally as Go Go Neketsu Hockey Club Slip and Slide Madness. So let's talk about this. This is a 1992 hockey game developed and published by Technos, where you play as the titular Kunio, helping out the high school hockey high school's hockey team playing in a national tournament. It's almost RPG-like, as a lot of the other games are in the series. Uh, but as you defeat other teams, you gain abilities and you can you play, you, you could wear those teams' uniforms, giving you different abilities, which is really, really cool. Uh, I love hockey to begin with, so I wasn't expecting to see a hockey game in Japan, let alone one in the same series as a dodgeball game. So this game was originally going to come to North America as Crash and the Boys Ice Challenge, but it was canceled. Japan got virtual console releases, uh, 2009 on the Wii, 2013 on the 3DS, 2014 on the Wii U, and 2020 on modern eShops. But it was also included <laughs> on Kunio Kun, the World Classics Collection in 2018 that had a total of 18 games, which this itself is also a new piece to the collection. Uh, another cool Japanese release. Uh, you know, I have very few Japanese Switch games, so it's cool to add that uh, nonetheless. But this is the original release to another game that came to North America, Double Dragon and Kunio Kun Retro Brawler Bundle from 2020 uh, for Switch and PS4, which was later published physically by Limited Run Games. So we got some talking to do here about these two. The games are mostly the same. Uh, World's Classics Collection has 14 games. Uh, Retro Brawler Bundle has 18 games. Um, I said this one had 18, didn't I? I think I messed that up. Uh, but the Retro Brawler bundle is special because a lot of the games that were included in... No, there are 18 games on here. Why did it say 14? I don't know. My research bad. <laughs> um, but Retro Brawler bundle is special because a lot of the games that were included on World Classics Collection were released in Japan 
and stayed in Japan. So this collection was more just a port of everything. But when it came to North America as Retro Brawler Bundle, uh, all those games that were stuck in Japan that were included on the World Classics Collection were now officially released in North America for the first time, including this game. So uh, we never got this game originally on, on NES when it would have been released, uh, but we did get it here uh, in North America on this collection. Uh, and when I was looking it up, uh, I was like, oh my God, it's actually on the back. Like the exact artwork, the exact name I said before. So I was like, that's really cool that there is still a way to play it. And it's a very wild story because I bought this game during a uh, limited run game's last blowout sale in January. Uh, and I didn't know the connection to Kunio Kun at the time. So let alone not knowing the game, I didn't even know the connection to Kunio Kun. I just saw a game being sold on a blowout sale and I, I picked it up. And literally I discovered the connection from this game to the World Classics Collection to this game that I happened to buy before all of them, before even knowing any connection. Uh, so during research, I found this weird full circle, uh, which is very, very cool. So, you know, essentially we have gone from Super Dodgeball to a bunch of Japanese games to this release, which is very, very neat. And it was a perfect way to end the episode with, with all that crazy stuff going on. So with that said, that's everything for this episode. Um, I hope you learned something. Uh, if there's something I got wrong, please correct me. I want to make sure I learn about these games just as much as I have been trying to. Um, and I also want to keep learning about this games, these games. So if there's something I got wrong, please correct me. If there's something I should have included, please tell me so that I know for the future. Otherwise, um, like I said, I hope you learned something and I will uh, hopefully see you next week. Bye.